Hello, welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. These are a series of lectures under the uh, general uh, topic uh, English language and literature. We have four modules as you are aware by now um, on uh, various aspects of English language and literature. The current module that is module 4 is one devoted to various branches of literary criticism. You have already been through a couple of um, literary criticism or literary criticism approaches, um, namely classical criticism, liberal human, humanism, Marxism, feminism, etcetera. Today we are in an important school of thought. Uh, this is not to say that the other schools are not important. However, why I say that this is important is because it, um, you know, uh, it was the beginning of, um, you know, a, a landmark, so to speak, or a watershed really, not a landmark, a watershed in the practices, in the way people practice literary criticism. And this school of thought is known as structuralist criticism, following which we have the post-structuralist school that we'll be talking about after this, right? So, what I'm going to do in this lecture is first give you, uh, you know, or tell you the, uh, about the important tenets of structuralism in general, right? Uh, structuralism is not something that you apply or that is applicable only to uh, the domain of literary criticism, right? So, we first talk about structuralism as it came to us through linguistics. Uh, then <coughs> I shall talk about what structuralist literary criticism is and in the end I shall be looking at how a poem, namely uh, William Blake's uh, famous poem, London, may be analyzed use, uh, using structuralist uh, critical tools. Okay? So, um, well then let us begin to talk about what, uh, which book we shall be referring to. There are of course, uh, so many books uh, available today. Right, um, as far as literary criticism is concerned, where structuralism and post structuralism are always featured. Right. However, for the purposes of this lecture, you may look at an, uh, a very useful book, a beginner's book, really, and it is entitled Beginning Theory, right, an introduction to literary and cultural theory by Peter Berry. There are also several other books. Uh, to that look only at um, so, you know structuralism and post structuralism that uh, those of you are, you who are at higher levels uh, may want to look at for instance books like structuralism and since then um, Jonathan Colors uh, the pursuit of signs okay uh, also structuralist poetics so there are several uh, titles that you may go on to look at but from my experience, uh, you know, as uh, somebody teaching structuralism, I have found that uh, students who do not know the basics of structuralism, okay, go on to say that um, they find structuralist analysis very difficult, okay. After which, post-structuralist and and in particular deconstructionist, uh, constructionist, sorry, <coughs> approaches to a text becomes all the more difficult. Okay? Well, it is not just um, students who say that, there are several uh, well, uh, teachers who also uh, do not like to uh, sort of dabble in structuralist and post structuralist theories. Uh, my uh, suspicion is, uh, and I may be totally wrong, but well, let me uh, say for myself, this has helped me a, a lot in once you, in the sense that once you know the basics of structuralism, uh, it, it, it becomes rather easy really to uh, you know uh, go on and read uh, you know a few more uh, you know quote unquote difficult texts, right. So, let us then um, ask you to read uh, Peter Berry. Now, as with many other lectures, what I shall be doing is um, uh, every now and then I shall be looking at or reading out 
certain extra extracts from Peter Barry's text in order and then I shall be like I do in the classroom, okay, sort of expounding on those or explaining those to you, okay. So, uh, what when we looked at liberal humanism, right, um, when you when you uh, heard, uh, you know, when you listen to Professor Borua's uh, Krishna Borua's lecture on liberal humanism, you uh, came to understand that liberal humanism uh, talks about, you know, the attitude to good, if you look at this slide here, attitude to good literature, which transcends the limit, limitations of age. Okay? So, there are you know, what we call the age old okay, literary works that uh, are always valuable, uh, whether in, in whether thematically or stylistically or to do with narrative or poetic style. Right? They transcend the overcome the limitations of space and time and they are always the timeless classics. Okay? Uh, next, we also saw that in uh, let us call it conventional criticism, in conventional critical practice, we look at the social, the political, the autobiographical, uh, the literary historical okay? to bring up in a bit to uh, look at uh, look at the text in a bit, uh, bit to understand or throw light upon various aspects of the text. Okay? And another way also of studying the text is the new critical way of studying the text, which is understanding the text and studying it in isolation. Okay? As um, uh, perhaps it was Arnold, if I am not mistaken, to see the object as in itself it really is, right? or what we call uh, you know, the autotelic text. Okay. So, today we shall find that structuralism is uh, different in the sense uh, that n not simply because it comes from linguistics, but also that it has some radical uh, pronouncements to make as far as language and then following that the literary text is concerned. Okay. Then we also saw a, on the liberal humanism or in again in conventional criticism, uh, the literary text being celebrated because it enhances, you know, it enhances life and propagates human values okay, or the moral school of criticism. It is also the literary text is usually and also by, you know, uh, everyone who reads the text okay, valued for its capacity for empathy and compassion. Right? So, moral values, the uh, you know the characteristics, the literary characteristics of um, the text right, as a new criticism, uh, the human, humanist aspects as well as the humanitarian aspects of the text. Okay? All these are critical schools, uh, critical approaches that are uh, taught in you know every institution even from uh, the school level. Right? Next, we are now turning to the structured school and let me quickly read from um, uh, Chris, ba this is actually Chris Barker who says that a structuralist understanding of culture is concerned with the system of relations of an underlying structure, usually language and the grammar that makes meaning possible. Okay? A literary text fundamentally is about meaning. Okay? You may talk about the style, you may talk about its historical moorings etcetera, but the reader looks for meaning in a text or the reader looks for the meaning of a text, okay? say a poem. Right? So, as we move uh, you know, through, through this lecture, you will understand that a text now is going to be looked at or is going to be analyzed not for the moral you know message it gives us okay or not solely for it nor also you know for its um, for its stylistic aspects right and that's the text in itself but there's something very different going in here okay we are looking at how meaning emanates the possibility okay of meaning or how meaning rather how meaning is possible in a text. For that, we have several terms that we will need to learn. Okay? Uh, the, again, as I said, if you are not afraid 
most of you are engineering students here because this, this course uh, is uh, actually has been designed for students at IITs and other engineering institutions, right. So, if you are not scared uh, of learning uh, those difficult terminology in your sciences, in you know in your physics or chemistry and biology for instance and in your engineering, then you should not also shy away from learning terms here, right. So, uh, then what did we find that the structure is according to Chris, or critic Chris Barker, a structure is understanding of culture and of cultural artifacts and of cultural objects like a literary text for instance, okay, is like understood in terms of a certain system, okay, in terms of a certain system within which there are relations among units from which meaning emanates, okay. So, we will you know unpack this and we shall uh, really easily understand what this means, okay, in terms of an underlying structure, hence structuralism. Right. The text now, the literary text, a poem for instance, is going to be now looked at in terms, not what the individual words kind of you know mean or you know the uh, only the resonances of the individual, the individual word per se, but we are going to see this in terms, the text in terms of a structure, right. And this structure or underlying grammar of a text is what makes meaning possible. Right. So, we are going to look at the text as what? The text as a system. Okay. So, let us the text here, a literary text is a system or is seen in structuralism as a system of relations. Fine. Now, the study of the sign, right, the study of the sign. Uh, more about this just a while later. The study of the sign which is known as semiotics or semiology uh, is part and parcel of understanding a literary text okay, from the point of view or from the critical approach known as structuralism. Right? So, when we talk about a literary text from a culture or sorry from a structuralist perspective, we are also bringing in the sign which is so to speak the building block okay, of both the text and of structuralism in general. Now, philosophically speaking, now if you ask about the philosophical orientation of structuralism, the mind, the human mind is seen as a structuring mechanism. Okay? We have certain cognitive abilities, right, and the mind, uh, the mind gathers or let us say uh, response to external stimuli to, to data that are coming in right how you know how does the mind let us ask a question like this how does the mind makes make sense okay how does the mind how does the human mind make sense of data that are you know the plethora of data okay that it is if i may use the word bombarded with all the time so the structuralists say or structuralist philosophy, if you will, say that the mind is a set of structuring mechanisms okay, through which it makes or with the help of which it makes sense of incoming data. These structure, you know, the mind therefore, through the stru structuring mechanisms follows rules to make, as I said, sense of the world, okay, the sense of the world or the external uh, world, mind, uh, the world outside of, you know, its, uh, uh, its being. And it, it, you know, um, it uses these structuring mechanisms, these cognitive structuring mechanisms, okay, to make sense of the world. Now we are uh, coming in this slide to a very important formulation given by the Swiss linguist, and you have heard of him, Ferdinand D. Saussure. Okay. In the, this is, let us say we are talking about the beginning of the 20th century, the first decade of the 20th century. So, Saussure's famous work, which actually was, uh, you know, uh, uh, published by his students and teachers, okay, who collected his uh, classroom, you know, lectures and who compiled these into the course in general linguistics. Uh, Saussure made a very important theoretical for formulation and that is if you look at this slide that 
uh, a word okay in language a word is a sign right now again he doesn't mean here the reverse that the sign is a word signs are things that signify something to us that that stand for something for us okay so signs are not only words remember signs can also be images obviously it can uh, be auditory it can be sounds it can be visual it can also be odor or smell right so something that uh, tells us uh, uh, something that uh, something that signifies and we'll come to that later signifies something okay so sosor said that a word too is a sign and importantly please look at this slide he split the sign into two component parts right the sign is comprised of a the signifier and b the signified now as i said remember in the beginning we have to know the basics we have to grasp the basics and this is where it all begins right so what did we find we found that a word is a sign and according to Saussure's formulation a sign is it comprises two parts a the signifier and b the signified for instance let us it's a very very common example that is used by every teacher almost i would say right so let's say the word tree right is a sign isn't it if a word is a sign the word tree is a sign comprising four letters t r e e right so this tree has one part which is the sound image say i utter the word tree right and the the other person can hear me saying the word tree the when we say tree it signifies or it uh, you know in our minds we have what Saussure so actually called not he didn't really call it a concept he called it a psychological impression okay a psychological impression or what we today call the concept so the remember the tree the uh, the word here we are referring to is a sign tree is a sign and tree comprises signifier which is the moment i say tree or even it's not just a sound uh, you know image it's also the written image for instance t r e e written here on this tablet right and immediately the psychological impression we have is what is signified by t r e e that is a uh, that is the idea of a tree not a specific tree but the psychological impression of tree right now if you look at this slide this whole process is known as the process of signification right so you recall now what is the um, uh, study of the sign known as the study of signs is known as semiology or semiotics okay the um, signs can take different forms that is images uh, visual images auditory uh, you know or, or auditory images um, odor or smell and writ the written right so anything that stands for something or signifies something we saw here again let me let me uh, you know recapitulate we saw that uh, you know we can take an example for instance tree uh, and we as as sosor has said the tree tree is a sign comprising two parts the signifier uh, tree and the signified that is our concept or psychological impression of of tree okay now the very important formulation that is given by Saussure is this that the connection between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary right the connection is an what does it mean to say arbitrary that is there is none nothing treeish okay there is nothing treeish there is nothing treeish about a tree that tells us please call me tree right now of, co of course there is evidence for uh, for it how the evidence is that the a tree is referred to in different languages by different words 
Now, if there was something tree-ish about a tree that asked you or asked us to call it a tree and by no other name, then the relationship between the signify and signified would have been a non-arbitrary one. Okay? That is, if you look at this slide, there would have been a one-to-one -one correspondence between the signifier tree and the psychological impression that we have. That is, there would have been let us use another you know or a proper word, there would have been an essential or ontological relationship between um, the signifier and the signified. But so source says that for instance, if I am uh, sitting on a chair, um, the signifier chair okay, gives us or gives rise to in our minds to a psychological impression or concept of chair, okay. but there is nothing chairish about this chair that I am sitting on uh, that would uh, tell people that uh, people to uh, or impel people to call it a chair. right? So, the sound or the you know the let even the letters for instance C H A I R have nothing to do with this physical chair. Okay? So, this was a very important and I said it was a very it was a landmark um, uh, you know theoretical formulation to be made. Now, again let me say it is not that you know um, uh, it is not that uh, the Greeks, uh, Greek philosophers like uh, Plato or Aristotle did not talk about it, but um, Saussure was in a juncture in literary in sorry in linguistic studies where you know when uh, he found himself in a scenario where the study of uh, or where linguistics was largely diachronic in nature, diachronic let us look at this word. Diachronic in nature, that is, it was over time, right? He brought in what we call the synchronic. You know, chrono is time, right? He brought in the synchronic approach, that is, look at language as a system, okay? Look at how language works, not simply at how language changes, not simply at historical linguistics or the diachronic or the change of language. Uh, language systems and languages over time. Okay. He wanted to conduct a structuralist, okay. he want, wanted to give us structuralist formulations on, on, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, on language and to show how the language system works. It's almost like you know looking at what this language system is in almost in a in a, a laboratory sort of way, you know, fixing it and trying to look at its component parts or how it works. Okay, so this is uh, an important uh, change in uh, you know the overall orientation of studies of language. So we found uh, that the relation between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. Again, what does it mean to say arbitrary? That there, there is no ontological or there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the signifier and the signified. Now, what does this mean then? This means that we enter the language system. Okay? We as speakers of a language have to surrender, you know, have to surrender ourselves to the language system. And this language system is a system of conventions, okay? conventions in the sense that we have to agree to call a chair. Imagine a situation in which uh, in the English language, uh, there were hundreds of words okay, uh, to signify tree or there are hundreds, thousands of words to signify a chair. Okay. What happens in that sense? In, in, in that in such a scenario, okay, there would be linguistic chaos right? and we uh, would never be understood. Even if you said that according to context, we may have different uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know we may have different words okay, for tree, it is quite the other way around really. Right? Because if you talk about chair, you, all, you talk about a phys, you know, an actual chair here, you also talk about the chair in the sense of a chair person. Do you follow? Okay. So, it is important to realize how important Saussure's contribution is and we shall see in a while how this could be applied to the literary text. Therefore, we may also say here that meaning is a combination of a sound image or also a written image and a concept. Okay. This is the association, right? the association of the sound image with a concept and that is how meaning arises in language according to Saussure. Therefore, a text, right? now again we I am not saying this is only a literary text, okay? text 
uh, it could be any text for that matter, a text is seen by the structuralist criti critic following, uh, you know, um, following structuralist philosophy and following structuralist linguistics that is, is uh, he or she sees the text as a structured system. Okay. Not remember now, um, not largely or solely uh, a text as a system giving us an, uh, or, or text as uh, an entity that gives us a moral message or uh, something that is very beautifully constructed with the use of you know proper language and use of all the characteristics that we talk about when we talk about conventional literary criticism. So, the text is a structured system here, okay. it is a system of signifying practices, there are signs in the text okay. and the, the entire text is seen as you know uh, a convention, right? a convention in both reading and writing of signifying practices, why because the, the words there are signs. Right, and those signs, um, you know, signify something. The signifier is supposed to signify something. Okay, they are also the text is also seen in terms of units and rules, as we shall see later. It is also seen, very importantly, though many may say in a reductionist way, uh, very importantly, in terms of core a core structure, which is known as binary oppositions. Please uh, look uh, here at the slide, known as binary opposites. For instance, nature and culture are binary opposites. Okay? Uh, light and dark are binary opposites. In culture, male and female, okay? good and evil, strong and weak. Right? So, a text can then be searched, you know, we could search a text for its, uh, you know, one of its core structuralist mooring, so to speak, okay? that is its binary um, opposite on which the text is sort of pivoted or on which the text stands. Right? So, meaning therefore, if you ask where does meaning in a text come from, meaning comes from underlying structures and as we saw here, one of the underlying structures here is what is the a core binary opposition or uh, you know uh, uh, a couple of binary oppositions on which so to speak the text is pivoted. Right? This way of thinking or this way of doing literary criticism, this kind of you know let us say philosophical approach or orientation. Uh, it is important for us to know is known as an anti humanist approach. Okay. Remember, anti humanist is not, not anti humanitarian, there is a difference. Humanism is a school of thought, okay. um, it, it is a phase in the history of ideas, it is a philosophy that sees the human. Okay, as the center of all reference, this is very important. Okay, the human being is at the center of all reference. Okay, uh, in terms of Freud, for instance, the ego, right, the individual ego, or even the collective ego, really, the ego is paramount here. Okay, and everything is understood as constructed by human beings. Everything is understood as coming from the ego. Okay. But a, the structuralist enterprise is one which is anti humanist or which lays more importance, much more importance really on structures in the system than on the human ego. Do you understand? Okay? So, it is nothing to do with not being humanitarian, okay? but simply put the human now the, uh, the human ego is out of the picture, now the structure is paramount in understanding reality, in understanding the literary text etcetera. So, if we extend this to any, any uh, you know uh, any aspect of culture, any cultural artifact be it text, be it music, be it dance, okay, be it any institution and its arrangements for instance, we then see the sign as uh, you know part of a whole system of units and rules right, through which only 
this is important or only through which we may understand cultural phenomena. This kind uh, uh, you know of formulation leads us to an important uh, anthropologist, uh, I am sure many of you have heard his name Charles Levi Strauss okay, who is famous for his work with the structuralist um, uh, you know uh, approach to anthropology okay, known as structuralist anthropology okay, where, we, where he, we also study where he studied um, he studied societies and communities uh, or you know um, using the structuralist approach okay, in terms of binary core binary oppositions or opposites okay, in terms of units and rules in you know uh, uh, almost certain schemas many would say even formulae okay, by which you understand the culture. So, therefore, the, what are the structures in, in uh, uh, question and this is given to us by Peter Barry. The structures in question are those imposed by our way of perceiving the world and organizing experience. This is the point we talked about you know in, in the beginning really how the mind is a structuring mechanism okay, and perceives an otherwise chaotic world and its data you know its enormous data in uh, you know uh, uh, by uh, means of its structuring mechanisms right. Therefore, meaning this is extremely important meaning is outside things rather than inside things okay, meaning lies outside. Now, uh, Another uh, linguist Roman Jakobson, okay, he talked about you know like, uh, 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 remember we talked about the tree and he talked about the, uh, the very basic unit as you know being phonemes, okay. the letters T R E E. Okay. He went even beyond the sign, remember this the word is a sign, he goes beyond the sign and talks about its uh, uh, you know uh, its formative units as the phonemes of these letters. Okay. Now, in, in, in uh, structuralist anthropology, uh, the structuralist anthropologist or like say Claude Levi Strauss talks about you know borrows this idea or you know uh, talks about or other uh, sorry talks in a similar way by, by talking about this core formative uh, myths. These are not myths even less than that okay, sub that is in at, a, at, a, uh, at an infra level which is the mythim okay see phoneme and mythim so mythims are the uh, formative units of a culture and archetypes have different meanings in different structures now the important point here is uh, many feel that it's uh, structuralism is so scientific uh, both in anthropology in literature in culture in in, in language or linguistics that it doesn't uh, uh, you know uh, it doesn't allow for any difference this is certainly not so okay we know that the word tree okay means um, both uh, an actual organic tree and it can also refer to a tree diagram Okay, that you are doing say in your computer sciences it can refer to a tree diagram, it can also refer to a family tree right, it can also refer to what we call in evolution the tree of life. Okay. So, it is not structuralism does not say I have or has structuralists have never uh, sort of claimed uh, that they are not looking at diversity in meaning. This is an important part variation of meaning in cultures is an extremely important part of structuralism okay, that meaning uh, the relationship between the signify and the signified is, is a arbitrary and that it may also according to context give rise to different meanings. So, therefore, as you see, uh, you see in the slide here meaning is relational and meaning is culturally determined. So, uh, let us again look at this slide for instance the myth of Oedipus you know uh, you are aware of the text very important text Oedipus Rex by, um, by Sophocles. Okay. Uh, now, Claude Revy Strauss's approach uh, in structuralism is for instance the Oedipus myth and this is given to us by Peter Barry. Um, in the Oedipus myth the cycle of tales connected with the city of Thebes for instance, the story and the cycle of tales are connected with basic oppositions, uh, binary oppositions again here like animal and human relation <coughs> or a person who is your relative and a stranger, husband and son. Now, you can read taking the cue from Oedipus, you can read any text in terms of its core binary or core basic binary oppositions okay. and these are 
going to take different forms, different contexts okay, in uh, as texts move in time and in space. Okay. But the important thing is to understand even there, though there are cultural variations, the structuralists have identified okay, these core structures right, that are there in every culture and also in every text. So, let me read as I said I would read from Peter Berry from uh, um, you know uh, uh, at times and he says that the typical structuralist process is moving from the particular to the general, this is very important. Okay? Placing the individual work within a wider structural context, the wider structure might also be found in the whole, the corpus of an author's work or in the genre conventions of writing about that particular topic or in the identification of sets of underlying fundamental dyads. Okay? <laughs> this is a dyadic structure of the binary oppos opposition. He then he goes on to say a signifying system <coughs> in this sense is a very wide concept. It means any organized and structured set of signs, okay? any organized and structured set of signs which carries cultural meanings. Included in this category would be such diverse phenomena as say works of literature, tribal rituals, uh, fashions, the styling of cars or the contents of advertisements. This is important for us to understand, even a literary critic like Peter Barry, you know, says that the structuralist interpretation, interpretive, interpretive or <coughs> sorry, interpretative method okay, is one that is not simply, um, you know, not simply to do only with linguistics or with the literary text. For instance, there are rituals that we may, um, may analyze in terms of structures, okay, underlying structures. There are advertisements, there are fashions, uh, there are styles of anything from, from cars to music as I said earlier to anything that may be seen in terms of what we call, what he calls here underlying fundamental diets. I just have some water. Time ki manase? Ten minutes, only ten. Fine. Um, we still have the poem uh, to look at, so I'll quickly, you know, talk about uh, what an, uh, another structuralist critic, uh, Rola Bath. Rola Bath really had two phases to his work. It is held that the early phase was a structuralist phase, and uh, the later phase being a post-structuralist one. Um, he had this important contribution to make. He said that when we talk about signification, we need to talk about signification at two levels. Let us look at this slide. One is the denotative level, the level of denotation and the other is the connotative level, which is the level, sorry here, the level of connotation. Right? Uh, the denotative level or the level of denotation is one that is descriptive and literal. Okay, you are not looking at um, you know uh, symbolic meanings here for instance. If you say a tree, you are simply looking, you simply understood it in the literal sense of being a tree. And uh, then he said that however, there is another level of signification which is that of connotation. Right? And he said that connotation is associative. Hmm? This is associative in the sense for instance, uh, this may be a little unfortunate here, I am just bringing it uh, as it has been given by the critic. Is when we talk say the word pig for instance, at the denotative level, we are the descriptive literal sense, we understand the pig as an animal. Okay? But at the connotative level, it may connote something else, something other than the animal. For instance, pig may refer to a male chauvinist, now again sorry for this uh, um, example uh, or uh, many say you know it is. Um, your room is like a pig sty, for instance, okay, or he is a or she is a you know. Uh, so, th there are levels at which we understand one is at the descriptive level and the other is at 
uh, the associative level, the level of association. This was given to us by Rola Barth, right. Therefore, myths or you know both in society, in cultures and in literature therefore, are always connotative. They connote or they are what he calls second order signs. Right? So, we are also to understand find out the connotative meaning in our understanding of, lit, of the text not just its literary meaning most of the pleasure in the text really I would say or, or we, we may safely say comes from the, uh, the level of connotation not simply at a descriptive level it enables a very rich understanding of the text. Okay? This connotative level again is not that all of us are going to uh, find the same connotations. Right? Um, depending on reader communities, de depending, on in de uh, depending on individual differences, depending on cultural differences, the connotations may be different. Okay? There is uh, as post structuralists would say right, uh, the privilege of the reader to read it unless of course, one is uh, making no sense or in a nonsensical way one is reading it. However, uh, the, there is the privilege of the reader to bring in a different connotative uh, interpretation to the text. Okay. So, let us now before uh, you know time runs out what we are going to do is I am um, going to look at the text in question. Right Now, the text is a well known one it is a poem entitled London by the English poet William Blake. Now, if you look here, I am going to give you a link uh, because of copyright reasons, I am not really showing this to you in a slide. Um, this is the link. Well, so let me read uh, the poem out to you, and as I said earlier, for copyright reasons, I am not uh, reproducing this here in the slides. You may follow the link, read the poem and then come back to my lecture. Okay? So, this is London by William Blake. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged min, uh, manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood da down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Okay. Please read this poem um, over and over several times and the one of the first things that we may say about this poem is an obvious one which is this poem is a poem of social protest. Okay. Right. It is a poem that talks about exploitation talks about exploitation right? and we shall see how it is again as I said earlier a text that could be read of course, in several ways no doubt about it, but a text it is a text that could also or it lends itself uh, quite easily to a reading from a structuralist perspective focusing on the binary opposites. Okay. Remember what were these binary opposites that we had pre talked about a while ago, okay. <coughs> for instance nature slash culture, okay. uh, human slash animal, male slash female, okay. Which, uh, light slash dark, these are opposites. Right. In culture we understand these things as opposites, though they may not really be opposites, but the mind structures these things as opposites. Right. So, what are then uh, the opposites, binary opposites in hearing in this poem London? Okay. Let us look at the first uh, stanza here. I wander through each chartered street. Now,
I wander through each chartered street. Do, when we do a structuralist analysis, we are going to find binary opposites in the first line itself. This is tremendously interesting. Okay. I wonder. Now, look, he Blake is not using the word walked. He could have easily used the word walked. I walk through each chartered street. It makes perfect sense. Okay. But he is using a word wonder. Now, to wonder again, what are what is the both the in both the literal sense and also in the connotative sense. Okay. Wonder here means to walk about all right, but more in the sense of roaming around. Fine. So wonder brings, uh, uh, you know, uh, carries the connotations. Okay. Um, you know, in the literal sense, we can say yes. Wonder also means wonder means to roam about, almost you know, in a sense of aimlessly. Right. What is the difference between walking and wandering? Right. Uh, you when you walk, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are walking. Or you know uh, about, or you know, or you have you are roaming around aimlessly. You have another word for it, wander. So this here means wander, roam around, okay, most aimlessly, which suggests you have the time, right? You have the time and the freedom to do so. Fine. Look at the word chartered, C H A R T R E D, chartered. The street is chartered, the poet, the persona is not. Okay. Chartered in the sense of hired, for instance, we talk about chartered flights, for instance, okay, which are only meant for a particular person or a group of persons, right? Hired in this chartered in the sense of hired, chartered also in the sense of having a license, okay, which is again to do with government rules. Do you follow? Okay. So, I wander through each chartered street. Now, the two opposites that we may glean from here are these, these two, wandering and being chartered. Right? Now, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles are here. Now, compared to this, you know, uh, person, the persona, right, who is walking the streets of London, who is no, who notices, right, the marks of sadness, the marks of woe, who notices the chartered Thames, the uh, the river full of you know uh, um, uh, once free flowing river now full of uh, commercial uh, you know um, vehicles for instance for maybe ships uh, or boats there okay in, uh, engaged in commercial transactions the chartered streets right the streets are also chartered in the sense that giving us a con at the connotative level right giving us a sense of something that is not free so one of the first things that we may talk about here we build uh, tentative binary opposition between the freedom of the poetic persona who registers these things and the restraint, right? The restraint or the constraints, let us say, of, of not just you know things in uh, in his surroundings like the River Thames or uh, you know the streets of London, but also the people who are constrained by woe, who are constrained by sorrow. Do you follow? Of course, so this is how you know even if you are not uh, deliberately doing this exercise, the mind will as you read the poem also be trying to make sense of it, not simply by the moral message or oh, this is a poem of exploitation or there are you know. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, we are talking about sorrow and, and weakness in London, okay, at a particular time, given time. Okay. The mind is also, um, <coughs> excuse me, subconsciously if you will, okay, making, trying to, you know, push things into either side of the two binary oppositions. Okay. Then, 
let us read on. After a generalized statement where everything is you know every person every face talks about uh, sorrow, every, every face talks about you know this infant's cry and there is the cry of every man. Okay, now, the cry here means not necessarily a cry of anguish, the cry here could also mean a, the cry of the vendor for instance, okay, the cries of commerce right of, of people uh, uh, you know in engaged in commercial transactions for instance. Um, okay. Now, he says that I hear the mind forged manacles that is chains, manacles are chains that have been forged in the mind. Again another you know another another image connoting restraint connoting constraint do you understand chartered um, mind forged manacles. So, we are now sort of managing the text or reading the text and our mind is managing it into uh, putting it in uh, you know in either side of the binary opposition. Then we have three figures okay, a very famous figures of the chimney sweeper sorry chimney sweeper then of the soldier right and of the youthful harlot okay so when we read this poem from a structuralist perspective right we can easily talk about another binary opposition that is of the exploiter okay, and the exploited. In this dyadic structure, we have the exploiter and the exploited. So, as we are reading what is happening or how this how even the meaning of this poem emanates is under this who is the exploited is the chimney sweeper right, the chimney sweeper and on the other hand the exploiter is shown here to be the church. Okay, the chimney sweeper at uh, that time these are young, these are very young boys who were sent up uh, the chimney you know to clean uh, you know the chimneys and they would often come down covered with soot sometimes even uh, you know even burnt even some of sometimes the skins would be scorched. Okay. So, this was seen as an exploitation of these young boys. So, the chimney sweeper is the exploited figure here and in the other hand we have the church. Then the next figure is that of the soldier who Blake says whose blood run uh, you know whose sigh runs in blood down palace walls okay. and on the other hand we have the palace. Okay. And the final figure is that of the youthful the young harlot or prostitute okay. and on the other hand we may say the institution of marriage. This of course, is a little problematic right. Um, there are critics and readers who would like to put place the harlot on the other side of the binary opposition okay, and saying that marriage here is a casual you know is a casualty. But if you look at the way Blake has written uh, the poem, we can easily argue otherwise okay. For instance, uh, when it talks about the chimney sweeper looking at the logic of the architecture of the text. So, it talks about the chimney sweeper uh, then he talks about the church that is the exploited. Okay. The next he talks about the soldier followed by the palace and here the harlot followed by the marriage horse. Right. So, anyhow in this reading of the text when we put the harlot on the other side we find that there is another by apart from the freedom and constraint or restraint or the lack of freedom uh, diet, we also have the exploiter, exploited diet. Okay. So, when we are reading this text, we are making sense of the text, our mind is sort of chunking you know these according to our core structuralist mechanism in our mind which is the binary opposition okay which cognitive psychologists would say uh, who carry out work on children that the one of the first things uh, cognitive operations in the in the mind of the baby of the infant is that of binary opposition. Okay. So, this is the way we would look now by no, uh, by no means is this the only way we have only I have just pointed out to you only one tool of structuralist analysis that is uh, of the binary opposition or binary opposites on in a text and we have taken William Blake's famous poem London where uh, we find that we can uh, at first reading we can easily 
um, sort of look at, <coughs> excuse me, easily, easily look at or, or find out that there are two binary uh, sets of binary oppositions. One is, uh, you know, um, that of uh, the freedom of the poetic persona who registers these things, okay. And on the other hand, the lack of freedom in, uh, in almost everything about London, be it its uh, river Thames or its streets, its busy streets, right. And um, uh, you know, all, all uh, most of the populace, right. And then the second binary opposition we found was that of the exploiter and the exploited, uh, which um, the poem structurally and in its architecture very clearly shows. Okay, it's really, I think, um, a majestic way uh, in you know, in, in, in a also very neat way in which the poem has poem has been structured. Okay, structurally, it is, you know, uh, is an excellent poem, right? Finally, sort of exploding in the the idea of the harlot's cry, you know, doing two things: blasting its newborn infant's tear in the in the form of a curse, and uh, you know, uh, sounding the death knell of the institution of marriage, right. So, this is one of the ways in which we can do structuralist criticism. There are many others, for instance, Rola Bath also uh, talks about certain codes, right. Uh, he talks about here um, the five codes which, are, which were identified by him in his uh, again seminal work as said, uh, he calls that a text, he says that a text may be read um, from the point of view of codes that are kind of um, signified by the text, these being uh, for instance the symbolic, the semic, cultural, hermeneutic and the pro heretic code. Okay? So, um, therefore, to summarize, structuralists would look at genre, okay? look at conventions. Remember, where is it we find the word convention? We found the word convention uh, when we talked uh, early on about Saussure saying that language is a system of conventions to which we surrender, right. So, the conventions of a particular literary genre, the network of intertextual connections okay, inside a text, the model of an underlying universal narrative structure, the recurrent patterns or motives. For instance, the recurrent pattern of exploit or exploited that we saw in the poem London. So, um, the next lecture would be on structuralism and I am quickly giving a preview here in the sense that um, when we talk about structuralism versus post structuralism, right, we see that a structuralist critic would seek parallels and echoes, uh, you know, of in the text as a system. It would look at structures, it would look at binary opposites, uh, seminal binary opposites or of the text and on intertextuality, while the post structuralist critic would move beyond that and search for contradictions in the text and how you know as was famously said um, how a text fails itself right. Look for contradictions, paradoxes, shifts, absences, disunity and really the impossibility of meaning. So, while the structuralists say, say that meaning is possible and then that the possibility of meaning is because of the underlying structures of the text. Okay because of the system of a system of relations where words that are signs in that system in a text right get on their meaning in relation to one another not in if you look at the poem london again you will find that the poem is a set a system of relations in which you know the word chartered is not simply that the <laughs> we understand the term chartered by its dictionary meaning but also in relation to all things that are chartered. So, quickly uh, if you get a question for instance like how is structuralism uh, you know watershed uh, compared to other kinds of you know more conventional ways of looking at a literary text. Then you would say that structuralism uh, the structuralist approach to literary criticism is definitely uh, a radical departure from other ways of looking at a text from older ways of looking at a text in the sense that it sees the literary text in terms of a system of relations, right. Uh, it sees uh, the meaning, eman uh, sees meaning in a text as emanating from relations of the words that are units in the text, okay, in relation to other words in the text. It sees, it sees the, the, the cumulative coming out, uh, you know, of the meaning of a text depending on structures like the binary structures and certain codes as Rola Barth had said okay, and 
on how words get their resonances from other words. Okay. Not only within the text, but also as intertextualist critics would say how they, they in a larger and if you look at uh, you know uh, uh, if you kind of expand the model and look at certain texts as nodes and how each text uh, within a particular genre okay, would uh, take off from the other where there are echoes of previous texts. So, intertextuality is also part of the structuralist enterprise at times okay, though it does stand uh, alone as a way of doing literary criticism. So, let us stop here today and, and again as I say you know um, the many ways in which we could have done this, but this being a very, very basic level lecture. So, thank you for uh, being with me in this lecture and in the next lecture we are going to look at post structuralism particularly at deconstruction. Thank you. Thank you.